All right, so we're going to get started. And um, the first thing is, this is playing the game of funding and finance. And the reason to call that that is that a lot of times people start out by asking for money, but really what you want to do is you want to start out by asking for advice and um, taking advantage of a lot of the services that um, Mike from Harbor One or Angela from Seed or John has to kind of get yourself prepared, get your company prepared for funding. And so that's, that's the nature of it. Also, it was a fun way of talking about fun, fun and fine, being fine in this time period. So let's start with, um, I generally start with a, a mindfulness exercise. Oh, we lost Nancy. Um, and the purpose of that is to engage not only your prefrontal cortex, which is your conscious mind, but to engage those parts of your, yourself that um, are normally operating in the background. And so what, what I do is we ask, um, Andy, you're going to take care of the, of the um, is we ask you to just take a deep breath and relax and, um, you know, notice where you're tense and just, you can, you can close your eyes or whatever. And, and oftentimes we're into an environment and we want to just sort of step back into ourselves, reconnect with what's happening. As you take a deep breath, just relax everything. Um, I often use images of, of water flowing down your, the top of your head, down your back and down through the backs of your legs, and then out through the bottoms of your feet. This is a basic grounding technique that we use in, in the mindfulness practice, and it does two things. It kind of um, expands your capacity to learn and to um, interact with the environment, and it also makes you less, um, less like a balloon, less subject to what's going on around you. So take another deep breath and now imagine that warm golden liquid just going right through your body, streaming down and down through your back and your torso and down through your legs and into the ground. And then set your intention for today. Um, it might be something, some funding question that you have it might be um, what you want to share with the people here um, that have joined us on, on Facebook Live. And just set that for a second. Our unconscious capability has an incredible ability to filter out what is going on so that you actually um, make that intention come true. So that's the purpose of that. And then just Think of three things that you're grateful for this holiday. All right. And thank you for the Lord for this opportunity to be together to share the gifts and the, the um, expertise that each of us has and for the opportunity to share this with the people with people that may be looking for funding. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do, we have um, Mike Robert. How do you say your last name? Robert Bear? Robert. Robert. I've been butchered Harvard my whole one. life. What? I've been butchered my whole life. It's fine. <laughs> okay. John Santos from Mass Growth Capital and Angela from Seed Corp. And we're going to start with Mike and just give us a little bit about what you do, um, your organization, and, and um, let's take it from there. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I'm Mike Robers. I'm from Harbor One. I'm a small business lender. Um, been with the bank for about 20 years now. Um, great place to be. Harbor One's been a very much growth related business. Um, we started as a credit union. We've been around for over 100 years. Um, and we continue to grow in a way to be able to service as many people as possible. Um, from the standpoint of, we were a credit union, we've now a full stock bank, which allows us a lot of opportunity. We went full stock shortly before the pandemic. So it's allowed us to make sure we're still at a high level of capital to be able to get through this, which is important. Um, it's kind of the overview of Harbor One.
as we, if we have your relationship, we are your partner and we can help you through whatever you need. Um, so that's, that's personal and personal banking and business banking. Correct. Um, and that it just makes those conversations go a lot easier and us to see a big picture to know exactly where you stand and what we can do to help on multiple levels. Yeah. Um, I know one thing I always talk about with customers, especially for businesses, is you need to have your trusted team. Um, and that is usually your banker, your accountant, and a lot of times it is your attorney. Um, you need those three people to be able to help you and help you grow and partner with you um, to be, make sure everyone's on the same page. And this voyage business for business, this slide that we have up. So how how are you um, uh, helping small businesses prepare for funding? So with Voyage and as you see on the screen, Harbor One U is really where it's launched from. Harbor One U is there to help educate and create programs, especially for businesses that are starting out um, and can use that assistance. Through Voyage, a couple of good things that are on there, you know, I mentioned that there's business advice. People are looking to start out, there's a, this template for um, creating a business plan, um, which is very helpful to see and make sure you know you're on the right path. Um, they actually just launched a podcast as well on there with our head of commercial lending and head of retail. Um, you know, nice, I think it's about 15, 20 minutes maybe, but it's a great listen um, to be able to see. So. Honestly, we could spend a whole day going through everything of what there is to offer through Voyage. However, um, those are just some some high level um, highlights on there. Very easily accessible right on harborone.com. You can go on and just kind of play with all the tools that are on there. Um, awesome. Another key okay. another key part of that is through Harbor One U. And Harbor One U is a great tool for any business owner and to go through different products, especially through um the businesses that are new and they're under two years in business um they have a great program called success for small business which you can go through um i believe it's a five or six part series go through those which are now held virtually through recordings um but you can go through all of those and you're eligible for up to a five thousand dollar line of credit which most banks like us you need to be two years in business in order to obtain funding so that's where Harbor One U can come in. Um, and like I said, from, from the partnership there, yep, it's on the screen now. Um, they're all recordings currently, just obviously with the pandemic going on, um, but you can go through those and you're, up, you're eligible for up to a $5,000 line of credit. If you treat that well after the first year, it can be up to 10,000. Um, so where most people can't get lending in the first two years, that's a great way to be able to um, get access to that capital. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, John, you want to go next? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. My name is John Santos. I'm with Mass Growth Capital Corp. And we're located in the Shrafts building in Charlestown, but all of us are working remote for obvious reasons. Um, but what Mass Growth Capital is, we help small businesses in Massachusetts. And we've been around for 10 years, but our, with our predecessors, it's about 40 years of helping small business uh, through many components of financing and managerial assistance. What we really do, though, is provide gap financing for small businesses. And, and there are three primary situations that this happens, uh, turnaround situations, transition, and growth. Um, we probably see more transition type situations where ownership changes and uh, whether it be from internal acquisitions, people, a CFO may want to buy a company um, and they need funding or an outside independent sales rep that likes the company may want to buy it. Those, those are, that seems to be the most popular transaction. Uh, but what, we, and we offer it, we offer our products very similar to a commercial bank. We have term loans, we have lines of credits and we do provide some bank guarantees to uh, CDCs and, and banks. Our term loans are up to five years. Our lines of credit are for a year, and we have to have a first position on accounts receivables and inventory. Our loan amounts range from 100,000 up to a million, but we also offer a micro loan 
that is uh, primarily through the SBA of, of 50,000. So we are, when I say a gap lender, we're a mezzanine type lender. We are subordinate to banks. We collaborate with many agencies like SEED and others throughout the state. And we're, we're not afraid to take the position behind them because um, our whole purpose is job preservation in Massachusetts. That's, that's some of the eligibility uh, requirements if you're, and we, the reason I say that is because a lot of companies may not be able to get financing um, through banks. And so we're, we're a natural partner. I spend most of my time calling on the banks to see uh, what they have for opportunities. And, and it turns out to be a very good relationship. We, we do not deal in startups. And that's um, one of the things that we, we are clear about at the opening. And, and that's why experience management with uh, good financial reporting capacity. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize this because we measure uh, usually when I entertain an application, before I even have the application filled out, I'll ask for interim reports and year-end reports. And what, how I see, how we look at the interim reports, if they're in great shape, tells us a lot about where you are and where you might need assistance, because we do, we do provide assistance in, uh, for our small businesses. Awesome. Thanks. So, Thanks, John. Let's, um, and uh, Angela, you want to give us a high level of what you do? And then we'll, we'll, we'll start a conversation because, John, you, you've touched on a lot of important points both of you have. So, let's, so Angela. Great. Thank you. So um, I operate, you know, alongside as a partner um, to both Harbor One and Mass Growth Capital. So we're really here to help um, fill that gap when bank financing cannot be obtained, very similar to John. And John and I work closely together, um, referring, you know, back and forth because we have different credit boxes and really provide that non-traditional financing. Uh, for us, we have three primary loan programs. We have the SBA 504 program, which is for the purchase of owner-occupied commercial realty, um, mm -hmm real estate and we work with a bank partner always on that program and it's great if you're looking to buy real estate for your business we also have small loan programs so we're an sba micro lender which allows us to lend anywhere from a thousand dollars up to fifty thousand um, dollars for both startup and existing businesses so we can lend to peer startups and we can go into some of the guidelines around that as well um, and then we have small loan funds that go up to two hundred and fifty thousand that either allows us to provide financing on our own, typically when the bank cannot assist, or if the bank partner, if the bank needs a partner on the loan, whether it's for real estate or it's for equipment, uh, working capital, furniture, fixtures, refinancing, high interest, either business credit card debt or high interest loans. So we have a, a lot of different programs that we can partner with and be creative on. Um, and then one other program I just wanna mention is we received additional funding recently due to COVID from one of our funding sources. So we're funded through SBA, but we also have other various federal and state grant funds. So really when you come to us, we'll have that inquiry to determine what do you need for financing? Um, how much are you looking for? Are you starting up? Are you existing? What, you know, John talked about job creation. So it's really important. There's a lot of factors that go into it and we'll, you know, figure out which program is the best for you. But our EDA funds that we've received are available for those businesses who really have been negatively affected by COVID. So we have not been lending to those businesses. Um, we were not a PPP lender. And then the EIDL funds were directly through SBA through COVID. But if you know or have anybody that has been operating an existing business in 2020, the business really had a negative hit from COVID, we do have funding sources available for those businesses. Um, you know, specific counties, typically our lending territory is throughout Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Some of the small loan programs are restricted to Western Mass. Um, it's more Southeast region up through the North Shore, uh, South Shore, some of the North Shore um, in all of the state of Rhode Island, Cape and the Islands. Um, but the EDA funds are available um, through most of the Southeastern Mass territory up through Essex County, but cannot be used in Middlesex. But something right. just to mind if you know of anybody so those are our basic programs that you know just to you know providing financing and 
different from the bank. We don't have any accounts or lines of credit. They're all term loans. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, ben Stein is here and Monica. Monica, um, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Sorry, my camera is turned off. I'm um, doing a couple different projects, so I was running a little late for the meeting, and I'm not presentable to be on camera. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And and Ben Stein is with um, with um, the SMBX. And ben, do you want to give a very brief um, summary of what that is? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm in a, a very similar situation to Monica. Um, but um, we at SMBX uh, are very, very similar to, I think, a lot of the solutions you all have heard um, from our, our first few presenters, um, with one major difference. Instead of a bank banking, making the capital and providing it, um, what we do is we connect you with your local community to raise your capital. And then when you pay back your bank loan, um, the principal plus interest gets paid back to members of your community. So it's a really great way to engage, to market yourself, to stick out, to be community branded, community invested, community owned to a degree. Um, the way it works is um, we issue what's called a small business bond um, from the business to members of the community. Each bond is $10. It pays back principal plus interest monthly. So members of your community can come in and invest $10. They can invest $100. They can invest you know, $10,000. And then every month you'll you'll pay back just as you do a, a bank loan, except um, instead of that going to the bank, it goes to to members of the community. So all these are very different funding options. Um, thank you, Ben. That's wonderful. Um, any questions or thoughts right at this point? All right. So the next is so we've got. Um, uh, um, how many people here, so Nancy and Monica, have you gone for funding or are you looking to do funding? Where, what's your situation? Um, I can go if that's okay. This okay. Speaking. Um, so I got funding or a loan rather through the Small Business um, Association as part of the uh, pandemic assistance. Yeah. Uh, I run two businesses, but I only applied for one. And it was, you know, it was relatively simple, <laughs> thank goodness. And luckily I have been able to run most of my business virtually, which is great. But I am thinking and hoping that when the vaccine has uh, been determined to be effective and, you know, most of the state has gotten their vaccines that I might be able to expand my business and have an actual physical location hopefully somewhere in the city and so i'm just preparing for that which is why i i wanted to join your meeting today just to learn a little bit more about funding i haven't had the need to get loans up until this point for the first time mm -hmm. and you know thinking about expansion and escalating my business, I realized I will have to get funding at some point. So I figured this would be a great opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about it. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And Nancy? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I am looking for funding, but more so on the grant side for now. But funding is something I'm definitely looking for in the future. Um, so that's why I'm here to obtain more information and resources about funding. But if there is any available grants as well, I think that would be my immediate um, step for now. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, it, I think one of the things is when you're, the, the, there's the common phrase, when you look for money, you get advice. And when you ask for advice, you're more likely to get money. So if you, if, uh, if you could, uh, each of the speakers just sort of say a little bit about what's the first step. What do you, when you have somebody coming to, to look for a loan, what is the, the entry point and what do you like to see? What is, what do you want to see with how they've prepared or whatever? Um, who'd like to go first? I can start. Okay. 
So for us, um, if, you know, if you're looking for financing, naturally your first step is going to be to go to your local bank, which it should be. So for, for us in particular, we actually need to see you've spoken with a bank before we can look at any request over 20,000. Um, like I mentioned, we don't have any grant funds. We do have all term loans. But when you're coming to us, you know, the first step would be to reach out to your local bank or credit union. If they cannot assist, um, that's really where we come into play. And for all of our first conversations, we find it best to have, you know, an inquiry call to discuss what your financing needs are and to discuss SEEDS loan program to let you know how we're going to look at things and to make sure that you'd be a good fit for our program. Um, so I would say always having a conversation. I can speak for SEED to say that our situation is very different. So although we do have some general criteria of what we're looking for, it really is on a case by case basis. So it's easiest to have that conversation and then we'll follow up and send you a list of everything that we would need from you in order to complete your loan request. Or if we find it's not a good fit for our program, we're always looking at alternative referral options. Um, for financing and or we have connections to a lot of different resources through the SBA and locally that we can refer you to as well if you're not quite ready for financing. So oh, awesome. So your first step is to have somebody give you a call. Correct. That's what you or a call or email to set up a time for just a general conversation. We just don't want to have, you know, you going through the application process. For Number one, it can be very overwhelming when you don't really know what to expect. You don't know what documents you need. So by having the conversation with us, and if we're able to look at it, we'll send you that documentation with a detailed laundry list of everything you need to make it clear as to what, you know, so you're not wondering if you have everything or unconfused on the best way to send it in and who to send it to. So we try to keep that as simple as possible for you. And then that way you're also not, you know, although in a lot of cases we don't know if we can move forward, so we look at things. If we know for sure you don't fit our guidelines, that way you're not um, taking the time to go through all of do those documents um, when we could have determined that at our initial conversation. So Mike, what's, uh, give us an example of, um, somebody who came a small business and they did it all wrong. You know, they, they came in and, you know, just give us a scenario, some, sort of a compilation of some of the things that you've seen. Um, you could do that. As you know, as Angela was saying, every situation is going to be different. Um, you know, and just to tie back kind of what I was saying before about the trusted partners, it's really one thing we do see is, and you might work with your accountant to make sure you can save money on taxes. So your bottom line ends up showing that you have a loss or you, your business didn't make any money last year, but then you come to us and you tell us you made 300,000 last year. Um, the biggest thing is we all need to be on the same page you need to make sure your accountant is understanding that you're gonna be looking to make purchases, you're looking to obtain funding, the, your tax returns need to be able to um, back that up. Um, in terms of another wrong, a lot of people lead with a line of credit um, and it's not always the best fit. Um, people just think I'll just, I'll just get a line that's easy and most lines of credit, like what we offer for small business, you need to be able to pay that line down once a year for a 30 day span. So it's not meant to extend so you can go buy your Bobcat, go buy your equipment, go do that and just have the line always be extended. Um, so it's really having those conversations and understanding what it is they're looking for, when they're looking for it. We wanna make sure we're talking to them when they're considering a purchase, not when they're at the point of purchasing. Mm -hmm. So talking early and establishing a relationship is, is, is helpful for small businesses. Correct, and an open and honest conversation is always gonna be the best. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, you know, maybe their credit got ruined in a divorce um, or something like that. That doesn't make them a bad borrower, but if we know the story and we know what it is, maybe there's ways we can look to, to get around that. Um, but an open and honest conversation is by far the best thing you can do. John, add anything? Sure. 
very much like Angela, um, we like you to have a commercial bank relationship. That's like the initial thing that I ask in the, uh, on the phone call. But to expand on the story, yes, if we have a good story, um, the next thing is, you know, do we, do we have a situation that, um, where there might be losses on the tax returns, but they're in a turnaround phase, the interim numbers are positive. And that's where, you know, that's when we'll start to look because we require monthly reporting of profit and loss in a balance sheet. So we will start right off the bat getting interim reports to see if they can have the capacity to debt service the request. Um, a lot of, you know, the banks operate where they, they cannot look at interims. They can't make too many decisions off of interim reports. They have to be careful. So that's where we come in and act as a staging area for them and have no prepayments. You can, you know, pay us off and get back to the bank where it's a lower cost. Um, so that's usually our starting point. And, and in many cases, we see the merchant credit uh, borrowing relationships, which are extremely high, average between 14, 15, 16%. And that's usually a sign of, you know, people need money to run their businesses. So we end up taking out a lot of those types of situations when the story is good, when the trends are favorable. Um, as I mentioned to many of my prospective applicants, don't be afraid to hang in there with us. It may take a few months because we want to make sure that you're stable and profitable. As I mentioned earlier, the seasoned management team is, is what we're really looking for. Uh, and to show that stability along the way. But that's usually before we even take the app, we'll try to pre-qualify because we do act as consultants. We're a team of uh, former commercial, well, we're active commercial lenders, but all of us have been with large and small community banks. Yeah, and, I, and, and before I let Ben speak, because I know he's got something to say there, um, the story, the story is really important. If you're not honest, and open with the good, the bad, and the ugly with your team, your lending team, they're not gonna have the faith and be able to trust you to make some decisions. Have you found that, you guys? 100%. Yeah, and so um, when you're thinking about lending, what you may be ashamed of or have difficulty with, you know, they've seen it all. And mm -hmm. they, they, are the, they have the expertise to know how to manage and handle those things. So be honest, be upfront and be open. And, and both um, Angela and John and even Mike, they have tremendous connections in the lending and finance community. And, and if they can't help you, they can direct you to somebody else. So when you're doing lending and when you're asking for money, your relationship is critical to whether you're going to get that funding. You've got to show them what kind of a person you are. Um, they, even the, the this interim reports that John is asking for, that, that may seem very, very difficult for you when you're asking for lending, but it keeps you on track and it keeps you from going into a bad situation. Um, I was working with a client and um, he, he was planning, he wanted a, a, you know, a, a, a market and he planned he was gonna get the market. And when we talked about it, it turned out that he was more interested, his exit plan was more of a distribution company. And so by having those conversations that you might not have had with on your own or with your friends, we, did, we determined that he didn't even need a storefront. So that saved him a high, high amount of risk and a lot of up, up, up front um, marketing costs. So Ben, you want to weigh in here on, on um, the MBX, the SMBX? Yeah. So we, um, there's one component of our underwriting that's probably a little bit different than other folks, which is we incorporate kind of like social metrics. So if you think about a business that has 100 followers on Instagram versus somebody who has maybe 18,000, we've started to incorporate like how involved you are into the community into our underwriting because we know that if you have that distribution strategy on social um, you're able to reach more folks in a unique way um, but i wanted to go back i think the way that we really look at um, 
underwriting and small business lending is there, there's kind of two two pieces which I think we fit on. There's like, and I'll, I'll, there's let me see if I can think of a good analogy. Sometimes I'm good at these, sometimes I'm not. The, the, it's kind of like um, you have your qualitative, right, and your quantitative. Your qualitative is the story, who you are, why you need capital, what your business does, the the intangible pieces around that. That to me is very much like, um, if you think about when we were in school, how you act in class, right? Like this portion of your grade that I think we're all kind of familiar with, right? Which is like, you know, how do you interact with the teacher? Are you turning in your assignments on time? Like all these other pieces. Um, that is great and that can be fantastic, but your report card are these profit and loss statements, right? And your balance sheet. And I think what I always tell entrepreneurs is, and small business owners is remember what your report card is right remember what you're turning into mom and dad at the end of the day you can have the best story in the world right you can be the best in class you can answer all the questions in class you can have all the qualitative stuff there if you don't have you know your report card if you're not bringing that home and that doesn't look good on the left no matter how good the story is on the right you're going to run into is issues and so I think when we think about that quantitative side, the two pieces that I really encourage folks to, to, to look at and to be aware of are, are two pieces. At the end of the year, right, make sure that your profit and loss and your balance sheet match, right, your tax returns. That's where we see and have the most friction is I've been updating my profit and loss and balance sheet. I went and turned all my stuff over to my tax accountant. He did some things to reduce my tax levels, right? Maybe we took depreciation here or there, but then I never tied the loop back and, and kind of updated my balance sheet and profit and loss. I just kind of assumed those two would go together. And so that's, that's the first place I would encourage folks is your profit and loss is like this and your balance sheet are like these, these report cards. But then when you turn them into the government, that's like cementing them in, right? Then that's final. And that's how I think everybody here valid. Anybody can bring me a profit and loss and a balance sheet and say, I'm making a million dollars a year. The way that we verify that is by looking at the tax returns and confirming that those numbers match up. When it comes to the interim stuff, right, when you're thinking about 2020 or before those tax returns are filed, what I would encourage you all as business owners to do is, is get in the habit of looking at those statements monthly or working with somebody to look at those statements monthly because those statements, there's like this, they're called GAP, right, which is generally, generally accepted accounting principles. Those are designed, right? Those guidelines are designed because that's the standard, right? Of which everybody can measure a business. And so if you start to look at your business as much as you're looking through sales and revenue by understanding your balance sheet, by understanding how to add assets to your balance sheet, whether that's equipment, that's inventory, that's accounts receivable, um, that is going to be the best way, I think, for you to move forward and to think about how to borrow more and more is that balance sheet that business needs to grow. And the way that we measure that is on the profit and loss um, and the balance sheet. Sometimes that's your net income, right? Most small businesses don't want to optimize net income because if you optimize net income, you're just losing 40% of your income, right, to taxes. And so at the end of the year, as you're looking for things to make a big purchase to decrease that, what I would always encourage you to do is if you understand understand your balance sheet, if you understand your P&L, if you can work with resources around you to strengthen those every year, it'll make the act of borrowing easier and easier and easier. And, and I think, you know, a lot of small businesses, they are going into business because they're excited about the dream and the vision that they have. And they're not that good at balance sheets and, and et, et cetera. So Mike, your uh, Voyage U and Harbor One U, is that, is, do you go through some of that kind of information and do you help small businesses in that area? Yes, um, I know there's a few different tools on there uh, for improving your cash flow, improving your profitability, understanding your financial reports. Um, it's, it's such a long list, um, but everything, it has all of those things to be able to assist um, small business owners to be able to really understand what it is they can do and what it is that's needed, you know, and kind of tie back on, on what Ben was saying too. If you can understand your profit and loss and you can understand your balance sheet, you can also predict without your accountant needing to have you rush at the end of the year to go buy equipment, 
you can be having those conversations because that's what we run into every year. It's December 15th and Mike, Mike, I need a loan. I, I need to buy a new truck. My accountant says, but if you were more in the conversation, you would have known kind of in October and November. And now those fire drills aren't going on because that is what happens every year and is already starting. And we're not in December yet, but the calls are, are coming in um, as they all, as accountants are all trying to figure out PPP forgiveness, you know, where does that fit into everything? Um, there's a lot of unknowns this year and that's what happens at the end of every year. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, even, even as a business owner, you may not be as deeply involved in the finances and the accounting of it, but you have to have to have at least a high level understanding of what your balance sheets and your, your profit and losses are going forward because you don't want your accountant to be signing the checks for you and making the deposits because that's where you get into you know problems with fraud. Um, so yeah. And in almost every case I'll say for small businesses too, there's some public company or big corporation where you can see kind of what that balance what you want that balance sheet to look like, right? If you're a small yoga studio, go look at a public, you know, at Yoga Works, right? Or Core Power or go find an example of what you're trying to build towards because those folks have kind of already figured that out and they'll have that almost like lay out what that financial, like what that bookkeeping side should look like for you long-term. So as you're making those decisions, it doesn't have to be as much guesswork, right? Or relying on maybe a bookkeeper, an accountant who maybe hasn't worked in your industry before. Um, there's other resources available for you and that'll help you figure out, you know, how to borrow more and more and more so you can invest more and more in your business. John? I think uh, yeah, you're tapping into some great points. So the reconciliation of monthly statements, Ben, is what we what we see and tend to identify as a problem area for a lot of uh, small businesses. And then acquiring a good bookkeeper is another thing that we look for because if they have somebody that's that can actually assist and they're aligned with the owner, it makes for a tremendous presentation and it makes for easy what if scenarios if they want to acquire equipment and or take on new loans or, or have more capital injected. But those are, those are valid points. And that's, that's, that's kind of the interview process that we take with a lot of our borrowers just to see the level of their, their bookkeeper, if they're properly reconciling. And then when the accountant gets it, it actually reduces their, their CPA bill if uh, they have a good bookkeeper that can, that can assist. So qualify a good bookkeeper. What are some of the characteristics? Well, you, you mentioned some of them, but so give us sort of a, a laundry list of what you see as a good bookkeeper. Well, what we, yeah, if they, if they, if their reports are accurate and they testify that they reconcile every month, you'll know right off the bat when you ask for receivable, payable, uh, cash flow statements, p l and balance sheets that you're going to you get the quality of it is is right out and they'll tell you i haven't cleaned up the balance sheet yet you know i'm still working on certain items that we have a question with because many times uh business owners uh, do not accurately uh, uh i guess identify certain line items uh, we had an experience where um they had three cf two CFOs that came in part-time and then they hired a full-time CFO slash bookkeeper and the company had problems identifying bad debt expense to the point when we backed into it, we found out that they were over allocating for bad debt expense and it was showing that they didn't have the capacity to service debt. So after three months of work, you know, we, our analyst, myself, we uncovered that, you know, you're allocating a little too much and shorting yourself. And they were thankful. And it was because too many eyes were in it and not consistently reporting, but no one really addressed it. Uh, and a very, it was a health oriented company where they're dealing with medical billings, uh, receivables, uh, getting paid, you know, quoting prices and then having those prices actually happen uh, a month later from the insurance companies made it very difficult to, for them to report. So those types of scenarios are, We'll uncover, we look at every, we, we uncover every stone actually in your company and we'll question to, to, to see if you got a good handle on it. And that tells us immediately where the bookkeeper is. And if they're humble 
and open to uh, our criticism, that's fine. It's even better because we're not perfect. We make mistakes too, but uh, but it's it's a tif it's a difficult business to present accurate reports if you have a complex business model. You know? I love that you brought up humility and humble. I think this is oftentimes when you you know you reach out with your company and and you're sharing what it is. It can feel very very personal, and I, I think the the always remember that these lenders, they're looking out for their bottom line, but they're also looking out for your bottom line. And so it's very, very important for you. It, it, it's a difficult uh, thing, but it's also very, very helpful for you and you growing your business. So let me ask you a question. So uh, how, how long does a company have to be in business before you will fund? And I'm gonna ask each of you. So Mike, Typically, we need at least two years in business. Okay, John? Yeah, 18 months to two years. Okay. Uh, ben? Um, we prefer two years, but we can go as early as six months if there's um, something that you're, that you're raising against. So accounts receivable, you have a purchase order contract. Um, there's like three of us that make the underwriting decisions. I'm one of them. So six months is, is the legal uh, minimum that, that's required. And Angela? For us, we actually can lend to peer startups with no history of financial, but we're requiring in that situation that there's, there, there's a secondary source of income for either the borrower or their spouse to be able to support the debt mm -hmm. and their household debt. So we can look at peer startups. So if somebody has a full-time job and is starting up a company, you will yep. consider them? We will, yep. Or if they're leaving their job to work at the business and they have a spouse that's able to support the household, uh, we can consider that as well, potentially, um, because we're looking at a, a global repayment, which is all personal income and expenses for both the borrower and their spouse. And that's usually what allows us to look at the startups when uh, traditional financing can't be obtained. So if, you know, if your company is less than two years, it sounds like Angela, you're the first person to start that conversation with. Yes. Nice. So, and Angela, you know, I mean, it, the SBA and, and the IDA loans and the, the PPP, can you talk a little bit about, um, let's say a, a, a new company is coming to you and you're, you have resources and knowledge of those programs. So. Uh, Give us a little idea of what you might suggest to a, a, a newer company. So I don't have, we're, we're not a PPP lender, Idle. So Idle was lent directly through SBA. Um, they were the direct lender on those loans. So and that's what uh, Monica got. Exactly. Yep. So you applied directly through SBA because typically in a normal world, SBA does not lend directly. They use intermediary lenders like us and the banks to get the financing out. So with COVID, they were lending directly for disaster relief. So you weren't actually dealing with a lending institution when you applied. Mm -hmm. In terms of like servicing and getting updates on EIDL um, and obtaining loan agreements, that all is directly through SBA. The PPP funding was, we also did not lend on that. That was lent from the banks. So the banks were providing their own financing and then they're applying, you know, the, the business would apply directly through their financial institution. Um, from the feedback that I received, most of the, you know, institutions that were lending on PPP were only typically lending to borrowers who they had existing relationships with. Um, so and those two funding sources, I know that people are starting to apply for forgiveness. I don't know the exact process to apply, but I would suggest if you do have a loan and you're looking to apply for forgiveness, you would want to reach back out to that lending institution that you obtain the loan through. Um, if you have questions on your EIDL loan, you would reach out to directly to the SBA. Um, for us, you know, we have that additional new funding that does not have to do with SBA, but it's uh, for businesses that have been negatively affected by COVID. Um, but, you know, we're trying to help and make the connections if someone's having a hard time getting in touch with the right people. We try to do our best to help them through that process if we have any information on that. 
Can you say a little bit about the 504 loans that you mentioned? Oh, yeah, that you mentioned earlier. Sure. So the SBA 504 loans, those, uh, that program is for businesses who are looking to purchase commercial real estate for their business. So with that program, it's, you know, really the major benefits to the borrower would be that you're able to potentially obtain up to 90% financing for the per commercial property, meaning that you would only have to put down uh, a minimum of 10%. If you're a startup business, so in this case, if you, we can lend to startups under the 504 program. However, if you have not been in business for at least a minimum of two years, so showing financials for two years, the SBA will require an additional down payment of 5%. So potentially you'd have to come up with 15% down. And then um, it also gets into anyone who owns uh, or looking to purchase a commercial property that's considered considered single purpose property like a hotel, motel, a gas station, a movie theater, anything that um, the property really can only suit one type of industry, it's possible they'd have to put another 5% down. But, you know, typically we're lending, you know, between the borrowers put down between 10 and 15% most of the time, um, depending on the guidelines. So in that program, the biggest item is that you as a business owner would need to occupy 51% or more of the space that you're going into. So you can buy mixed use property. Like if you had a storefront on the first floor and then you had, you know, an apartment above, as long as your business is occupying at 51% or more of the total square footage, um, we could potentially make the loan to you. So you could have a commercial rental or a residential rental. It's just a matter of, we again, we go back to having job creation, benefiting the business. SBA doesn't want to lend on investment properties per se. So you have to be able to support the full debt payment and then um, occupy a majority of the space. So that can be used for real estate acquisition. So if you're want, looking to buy the building you're in, maybe you're looking to buy an office condo or to buy a building, you can even um, construct a brand new building under that program, or you can buy a building and then construct and add an addition or a renovation. So there's a few options, but it's a really great program. Um, what happens is the bank falls into, you know, a typical structure would be that the bank is in a first lien position on the building. They'll provide 50% of the financing and seed will come into a second position and provide up to 40% of the financing. And then you would have to come up with 10%. Uh, so the bank will set their own rate and term. And then the other benefit is that seeds piece will be fixed for either 20 or 25 years. And the rates right now are below 3%. So they're extremely low. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of great benefits to that program if you're looking to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, earlier there was mention of uh, grant uh, opportunities and I just wanted to say, I think Nancy asked, um, pay attention to our website. We just went through three grant programs. The window unfortunately is closed, but um, we do have, I think, I think there may be more coming through the CARES Act and then through HUD in our legislature. So uh, stay tuned and talk to your town officials also, uh, especially economic development offices and bankers, because they're aware of, uh, of, the, of the grant programs. Um, so if she's looking for grants, then um, that would be the place. Bankers, lenders, small business lenders. Yeah, and economic development offices in their local towns. Um, for Chamber. example, yeah. It's, it, in our website, you know, we'll we'll keep you posted. Uh, and we'll show you that. Programs coming out. Thank you. All right, Marcy, well, we have Marcy, can I just speak on one thing too? Sure. Um, also, with all the programs that are out there, you know, it's more important than ever that borrowers understand what they're applying for. Mm -hmm. um, we're running into a lot of that now, where they came to us for the PPP loan, and then they went to the SBA for their EIDL, whether loan or advance. Mm -hmm. Now they're at the point where maybe they got a $8,000 advance, they got a $20,000 PPP loan, so only $12,000 is forgivable. So now they are at the point where they'll have a $8,000 loan in the end um, when they weren't really 
understanding and it, it understandably so in the world that we're in in the pandemic and all of that going on but really it's important to understand what it is you're applying for and what the impact will be on what other programs you can do so um, I just wanted, so I'm, this is being done through the Metro South Chamber. It's, I'm, I'm involved with the Chamber. And if you are a small business and you are looking to get valuable resources to be connected with other potential businesses, the Metro South Chamber is an awesome way to do that. Um, yeah, so um, Mike, John, Ben, Angela, are, and Rich are all members of the Chamber. I am too. Um, it's, it is a really great resource. So do keep the Metro South Chamber in, in, um, in mind. They are having almost weekly um, uh, live uh, networking events. And then also uh, on Fridays, um, I think it's the 4th and the 18th of December, there's the COVID update. These are regional, and, but they include a, a lot of top officials. I think we've had Charlie Baker and um, people from the SBA all coming to speak about what's happening in, in the economy. The other thing is that the chambers are your go-to when for economic development. The chambers are involved in the political process and um, and help you make um, keep make a, a business friendly environment. Um, so uh, let me just share the screen here and. So this is the contact information of these three people. If you get nothing else, get their name, phone number, and email. Um, they'd be happy to speak with you. And then, um, and then for upcoming events with FleeWorks, we have an ongoing Launch Your Business Mastermind. That's on uh, Thursdays at 9. Our next uh, webinar or next Zoom meeting is called Social Engagement Is It Marketing? And this is an opportunity for people to kind of get an overview of where they should be marketing their companies and um, some of the ways that um, social media is effective. So that's next Tuesday at 12. And the last one of this Launch Your Business series is called um, Party Like It's 2025. Essentially what's gonna happen is people will come, they could, they could have not even started their business, but they're gonna come and talk as if they've accomplished all their goals by 2025. Research shows that if you talk as if it's already happened, that there's sort of all the, your, your subconscious and the subconscious of everyone else helps you actually reach that goal much, much faster. So that should be really fun. And that's the end. Uh, I am doing the holiday resilience kit on December 10th at the Easton Public Library. That's a free event. All of these are free so far, except the Launch Your Business Mastermind. And then there'll also be other um, holiday resilience kits off, being offered in the beginning of December. So, you know, there's my phone number and email down below. Just text me or email me what, you know, to learn more and we'd be happy to get information out. And I'll put this back up so you can see that. And I'd like to thank you all for coming on. Um, it's an unexpected pleasure to have you, Ben. That's great. And, um, and thank you again so much. This is, it is live and it will be on YouTube shortly and we'll all get a, a link to that. So wonderful. Thank you so much.